growing in knowledge, it works or it doesn't. And we're continuing on the theme of knowledge. And this time we're heading it from a different angle. Last week we were covering it from the basis of knowledge and understanding. This week, the sermon activity was from 2 Timothy 3. I probably should have included 16. I only wrote 17, but 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof. There we go. We got the right word out for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The knowledge has a purpose. It's there so that we are equipped for every good work. And then continuing with 1 John 3, 7 through 10, which were, was already read, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, God, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of, devil, of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Key word there is practice. Meaning, doing it intentionally, trying to get better. If you don't practice righteousness, you're not going to get better at it. We don't tend to think in terms of practice an awful lot. We tend to think that's like lessons when you're trying to get better at an instrument, trying to get better at a sport. We practice that. Or if you're my dad, the practice he likes to talk about is they're practicing medicine and they still haven't gotten it right. Um, and he'll be a bit more angsty about it than that. Because right now you look around and you have to say, yeah, there's a whole lot of practicing. I wish they'd figure out what they're doing. But on the passages we're looking at today, one person submitted information, thoughts on what we're covering. And it's, he said, in anything we do, it's impossible to do what needs to be done with the knowledge that goes with it. I'm sorry, without the knowledge that goes with it. We have everything we need to know supplied in scripture. We must be like the Bereans. And he was referencing Acts 17, 11, where it talks about how the Bereans, unlike the Jews and the Thessalonians, they were people that searched God's scripture daily so they would have the knowledge. And then there's a quote from William Buckley, and it was right on target on the money. He must study the scriptures to make himself useful to God and useful to his fellow men. He must study not simply to solely save his own soul, but that he may make himself such that God will use him and then help to save the souls and comfort the lives of others. We don't just have knowledge to have knowledge. We have it to use it, to put it to its proper use. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, it says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And it was interesting that Chad brought up wanting to do music and so forth because I want to do music. I enjoy it a bunch. If you have the printed music and you have the piano, you've got to play the piano to hear the music. Having the notes, the proper guidance, doesn't do you anything. Having the best instrument doesn't do anything 
until you put the two together and actually perform the piece. Sarah can tell you I used to have a very interesting guitar lesson. The guitar lesson was between two polar opposites. I know music theory. My instructor in guitar did not. He played by ear. That's how he learned to play the guitar. I have no physical ability when it comes to playing the guitar. Okay, I've got some now. I've been practicing for a while. I don't practice enough. He had a ton of physical ability. The problem was when we first started practicing together, he could do stuff that sounded beautiful and then sounded terrible. Why? He didn't really know what he was doing. His hands so, could so do what needed to be done. He didn't have the knowledge to do it right. As time went on, I was teaching him music theory while he was teaching me how to practice playing on the instruments. We had some crazy lessons because both of us were too headstrong for our own good. But it took both the knowledge working together with the works for it to come out right. Continuing on with James 2, verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, his faith was made perfect. We've got to recognize that faith, belief, they're the same word in the Greek, Without works leaves us no better off than the demons. They know and understand there is but one God. But they're not working with that knowledge. We know better than the demons. And we have a choice. It's not about earning our salvation by our works. And we need to be clear on that as well, because sometimes people take the James passage out of context. It's not saying that works trumps faith. It's saying works goes hand in hand with faith in our salvation. Then the righteous will answer, this is from Matthew 25, beginning with verse 37, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And I'm going to pause there. This is when Jesus is telling them about the judgment. He's telling them they're going to be separation. The sheep are going to the left or the right, and the goats are going the other direction. Those that followed are on one side. Those who thought they could do it their way are in a different group. And when talking to them, he says, there's the righteous. And they're going to do all these kind of things. And the righteous are going, wait a second, when did we see you? Because they didn't totally listen to him. When you saw me as a stranger, when you didn't really recognize me, you still did. And because you did, the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. It wasn't because they saw the opportunity to get in good with the head guy. It's because they saw somebody in need and they responded, no matter how least they were in society. It's about working, period. Working the works of God, period. 
serving those in need. Jesus tells them, I didn't come to save the righteous, came to save the lost. He didn't come healing the healthy, he came healing the sick. Why? The sick had the need. Why couldn't he help the self-righteous? Because the self-righteous already knew how good they were, and they didn't need God to tell them any different. Continuing farther down in Matthew 25, 46, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There are consequences for those who do not act or work for God. Those who saw themselves that were self-righteous knew the good works they'd done. I give money. Yeah, you give out of your wealth. The woman who gave two pence gave all she had. Who gave more? It's easy to give away a thousand dollars when you're making a couple of million a year. That doesn't hurt. You don't feel it. It's less than a percent. We need to recognize we have abilities, resources, we have talents. Those are given by God with a purpose. The purpose is to use God's way. But as was pointed out by the additional scripture that was given this morning, that was by Robert Bell, it was given with a right intended and purpose. That if we don't know God's word, we're not going to know how to do it right. We've got to go to this book to have an understanding of what real good is all about. Because if the only people I do good for are the people that do good for me, Am I really helping out those in need? No. Who did Jesus come and help? Who did Jesus recognize when he was here? The outcasts of society. Not because he was trying to glorify them, but because he was trying to help them. Touching the leper who was untouchable by the rest of society was letting them know, in spite of what everybody's done to you, you're a person made in the image of God, and that's got worth, period. Guess what? Everybody today is still made in that same image, in the image of God. We need to be able to recognize and reach out to those in need to be able to help them. Why? Because that's the example Christ gave us. That when we talk to those who nobody's talking to, when we take the time to find out how somebody's day has been who doesn't look the most cheerful right now, we're taking the time to recognize those who while society may not need them, God values them. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. There are a diversity of gifts. We're not all the same, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And I bolded that last part because while it's talking about our works, our activities, who's the one working through it? It's God who's working through those diversity of gifts. God is accomplishing through the different things that we do. We talked about this briefly in the men's class this morning. When it comes to encouragement, I am so not the one. I don't have that as a gift or a talent. If you got to see me in a dog training class, I'm the one that the teacher gets frustrated with and says, okay, 
Time for a demonstration of how not to do it. And she says, Mr. Kelly, can you come up here? And I go up there. She's got the newspaper in hand ready. She goes, okay, Mr. Kelly, scuba gnaw. And I just stand there. And she takes the newspaper, whacks me upside the head. Let's try this again. See if this helps. Scuba gnaw! And she sort of yells in my ear. And of course, <laughs> nothing happens. So she whacks me on both sides of the head. Everybody get why this is not working? Mr. Kelly's got no, no understanding for what scuba gnaw means. And if I yell it at him louder, it doesn't work. And if I had a chain around his neck and was jerking on it a bit too much, like he was doing with his dog, the dog still wouldn't get it. You've got to show it in a way that the dog understands. You've got to work with, grow, and develop. And we're not all going to get it the same way as quickly and so forth. An encouraging person, a nurturing person, is the kind that can better come alongside and say, okay, scuba gnaw. And she takes and pulls me towards a chair and pushes down on my shoulders. Scuba gnaw meant I was supposed to sit in the chair. Yelling the command at me when I didn't understand what it meant is like yelling at the dog to sit and the dog doesn't understand English either. Encouraging and nurturing is a gift that can be used in growing the kingdom of God. I'm not that person, but somebody else here is. We each have different gifts and abilities. Trying to make everybody do it all the same way, as far as gifts and ability, that's not how the body works. My pinky doesn't operate like my right arm does. They're different. Take away one and I'm a hurting puppy. The example I used in class this morning is archery. I might use my right arm to write with and do a lot of things because I'm right-handed. Take away my left arm and I so can't draw the bow. Why? My left arm is my gross motor skill. It's the stronger one of the two. My right arm is for finesse. It's weaker of the two. Both of them are needed to work together. It's not just the diversity. It's the understanding. This operates different than this. It takes both to have that fully operational body with the understanding this is going to play out differently than this. We have diversity of gifts, but we have one God. I've only got one body. The left arm can't go off and do what it wants to do while the right arm goes off and does what it wants to do. They work together because there's one understanding that's guiding it. As the church, we have to work together based on the one understanding, the one God. And the cool thing is, it all begins with a similar concept. If we look at Acts chapter nine, beginning with three through five, this is Paul before he's Paul, when he saw on the road to Damascus. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. He encounters Christ. He encounters him in a miraculous way. Jesus has already died, as far as the crucifixion, been buried, been around for an additional 40 days, and has ascended. Saul is meeting him well after that. It's a miraculous meeting. But it takes more than a miraculous meeting. Verse 12. 
In a vision, this is referring to Ananias, I'm sorry, it's referring to Saul. He has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Because Saul, in that instant, loses his sight on the road to Damascus. The blinding light was really blinding. Saul became blind for a time. <coughs> Excuse me. And then jumping all the way to 17 through 18. Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. I'd like to break this down as to what happened, when it happened, and what didn't happen until somebody chose to act. Saul wasn't saved on the road to Damascus. He had a miraculous meeting with Jesus, but that wasn't what saved him because Saul hadn't done anything. It wasn't when he fasted for three days because after he's been blinded, he gets into Damascus and he fasts for three days, not eating or drinking. And fasting for three days is not what saved Saul. Then there's a miraculous healing. Ananias was told, Saul's already seen you in a vision. He knows you are coming to give him back his sight. That's not what saves Saul. Salvation is an act that isn't just of God. It involves me too. Saul is not saved until Saul chooses to act on what he knows to do. Saul was and baptized. Saul understood he was going to get his sight back. That isn't where he received the Holy Spirit. He received his sight. He doesn't receive his salvation. He doesn't receive the Holy Spirit until Saul acts. It's sort of like becoming a police officer or a person in the military. You can put on a uniform. That doesn't make you either of those. You can strap on a gun. That still doesn't make you either of those. You've got to go in and sign on the dotted line. Until that time, you can complain, claim to be a police officer. You're not a police officer. You can claim to be in the Air Force. <laughs> You're not in the Air Force. <clears throat> You've got to act on the commitment you're claiming. Act. You can't claim to believe, claim to have the faith, and not act. Because that's where this all began. Claiming righteousness, claiming faith, and having no follow-through is not of God. It's actually leaving God out. It's sort of like in marriage. Oh, I love you. Really? Why don't you ever come home? I'm committed to you. Really? Then why are you having that kind of relationship with that other person? If the actions don't follow the faith and commitment, it's a lie and it's of Satan. Unfortunately, the real world, the real world, the world does a good job at lying about this kind of stuff. You don't have to be faithful to your spouse. I'm sorry, everybody here knows that stinks. We understand what it takes to be faithful, and committed. It's no different when we're talking about being faithful and committed to God. It takes real action, real work, based on His words. 
Because you know, there are things that I like, things that I love doing. And Vicki could care less about them because she's different. I like to shoot archery because it's what Sierra likes to do. And I do that with Sierra. If I go shoot archery with Vicki, Vicki's just gonna get frustrated because that's not what Vicki does. But Sierra likes it, isn't it good enough that it's what Sierra likes? No, any more than doing something we think is worshipful when it has nothing to do with what God has asked us to be doing is truly worshipful. If we're ignoring what God has asked for, we're ignoring God. When we're making a commitment to God, just like when we make a marriage commitment, that commitment to Vicki wasn't on my terms. It was understanding what she desired out of the relationship as well. When we make the commitment to God, it's not on our terms. It's with an understanding of His Word. An understanding of what it is we are truly committing to. That's when it all begins. When we choose to act based on His standard. Because truth is, if you believe He's God, then you believe he knows best. If you believe he's God, you believe he's seeking what's best for you. He's even said that. So either he's telling you the truth when he says, I seek what's best for you, follow my direction, or you're saying God's a liar. And you don't need to waste your time playing church. He calls us as one God, recognizing each one of us comes with different abilities. They can all be used in the body of Christ to show the world there is a different and better way, and it's His way. If you need to take on Christ in baptism or you need the prayers of the church, you're more than welcome to come as we stand and sing.